Hello everybody and welcome back to Esports Wales Weekly. We are here for episode 3. Um, this week we've got a few nice topics to talk about as well as one major one that's been in the news recently. So um, yeah, we have our first guest this week. He is the Dota Underlord. He is also our business manager. It is Craze. Hey, don't let the uh, ego go to your head. All that jazz. Well, I should be saying that to myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be back. See you. Uh, feel free to spam chat with uh, Papega. <laughs> okay, so our, for our second guest, uh, we'll be seeing whether he is worth his waffles. He is one of our moderators. We have Wafflesworth. Hi, I'm Wafflesworth on Discord and Paul in real life. I'm moderator for Esports Wales, which means I'm one of the people to try and keep the peace there, as it were, to be fair. To be fair, we've got a pretty good bunch in Esports Wales, so I don't have to. Uh, another role I have within Esports Wales is Overwatch Ambassador, trying to get interest for Overwatch. And I also do a bi weekly community night, so if anyone wants to join into that. And I'm also on Team Yar for Overwatch. Yeah, okay. And then uh, the old saying goes it's usually best to be seen and not heard, but for this week, we'll be hearing him and not seeing him for our final guest. It is our Rocket League manager, it's Eclipse. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me as well. Um, I, I manage Rocket League in uh, in the Discord and just for Esports Wheels in general. I help build the teams. I make sure no one's being stupid and uh, make sure the teams run smoothly and there's no quarrels and stuff pretty much. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's effectively what I do at the minute and uh, it's, good. it's good times. Yeah, okay, so um, the first topic that we are going to be talking about is can be classed as somewhat of a controversial topic. It is microtransactions. Um, it's been in the news recently, and that's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it. Um, I, I went out, did a little bit of uh, almost market research. I went and asked a few of my followers on Twitter to get some of their uh, opinions on microtransactions. We do have a couple of them that I will be showing on screen right now. So, from at Finney TV, who is actually our web developer... Uh, he says, I have no issue with microtransactions providing they're for cos cosmetic items only, and those cos cosmetic items can also be um, acquired through gameplay and not just restricted to microtransactions. Oh, no, no, they must be required through yeah, gameplay. Yeah, I, I corrected him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to call him out on that. It's okay. <laughs> Moving on to the next tweet. Uh, this is actually from a former game dev, so it's I feel it's got quite a bit of, uh, I'd say, a big opinion behind it. So, uh, at NeoCuro2 on Twitter says, uh, As a former game dev, I don't think there is an issue with them, provided, uh, one, the game is free to play and the items aren't overpowered. Uh, two, the game is not free to play, but they are purely cosmetic items and do not influence the gameplay. And then three, there should be some way to earn the items in-game. And then for the final tweet, this is actually from uh, Mango Tango, who is, um, he's, I think he's quite well known in the fighting scene uh, in South Wales. Uh, he does participate a lot in the uh, fighting nights that go on in, um, I can't remember the, can't remember the place, but either way, um, he did his dissertation on the microtransaction monetization model. Um he says, it's the most popular model in modern times due to the fact that the casual player and gamer now massively outnumbers a traditional console slash PC player. Um, it was a huge success and thus translated very quickly onto more mainstream games. It is an, it's an excellent method of removing the paywall and allowing players of all budgets to, uh, to be able to join a gaming community they're interested in. Um, so yeah, moving forward from this, I have personally... Uh, spent a lot of money on CS:GO alone. Uh, I used to back going back. I've, I've I think I've spent just o uh, under one thousand uh, pound in total on opening cases. Now, considering I've play been playing the game about probably about four or five years now, it doesn't sound that much. But uh, <laughs> at one time, I was actually stuck in a vicious cycle where I was buying around fifteen k uh, keys a week, costing one pound sixty nine, which comes to about just about twenty five pound a week. Well, considering I was only on, I think, 400 or 500 pound a month there, that was a lot of money of my wages gone just on buying CSGO keys. Um, so, like, taking those tweets into account, uh, what would you, 
what is the what needs to change with microtransactions? Because I've been seeing a lot of things that a lot of people saying on Twitter that it's the developers' fault, it's uh, parents' fault, it's the kids' faults who say maybe don't understand that they're uh, spending real money. What 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 are your opinions on the matter of micro microtransactions? So um, I'll go first. Here you go. Um, <clears throat> so I think my kind of perspective on it generally is, is I think what the, the general consensus is that if it doesn't affect gameplay, it's fine. Um, but the issue is, is that there comes kind of a, a psychological element. Um, so for, um, say, for example, with Overwatch, right? Because people feel like they play better um, when they have the better skins, et cetera, et cetera. It kind of reinforces and re and, and encourages the ideology that you should buy the boxes, buy the skins and whatever. Like if you take a look at, um, say for example, CSGO pro scene, who's not got a knife? Who's not got, a, you know, like a, what is it? A, a Karimba or something? Like that? I don't know the knives in, in CS, but yeah, I know what um, you mean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because they have those things, you think you, the association is that having the custom, yeah, excuse my bird in the background, um, because they have the better stuff, you make it makes you think that they're playing better, and that's not necessarily the case, but it's it's kind of true true across the board. Um, and it's like when you start to look at stuff like kids with FIFA, that's like a whole another level of, of concern with like FIFA Ultimate Team, right? Because kids will just buy more and more packs to um to, to hope they're getting that you know that one messy or whatever and it's not going to happen and you know it's not going to happen um i think there's a the, the we need so where i kind of sit right is that if the if it doesn't affect the game it's above board relatively but if it does affect the game game companies are not going to stop doing it because it's a way to get additional finance out of um, games that have been sort of relatively relatively short-lived. Let's look at any sports game. And in those situations, there needs to be quite a, a high level of transparency uh, in regards to the figures of, of, you know, what's the chances of you you do get that messy? What's the chances of, you know, you get the, the Arcana or whatever? Um, and the lack of clarity on that front leads to um leads to a lot of the issues that we have i think the issues would still be there regardless of the statistics being being shown but it would keep things quite above board um i think that's a really positive approach that we've seen in like um like say for example northern europe um they've started to put in legislation so that statistics have to be shown which i think is a is a really positive thing there you go waffles have you got any opinion on it because i know uh i do know uh, Overwatch does have its own loot crate system, and I, I know you have, uh, I don't know whether you've spent money on it, but I know you do open them quite frequently. Yeah, sure. I mean, personally, I separate microtransactions and loot box. Uh, microtransactions to me are things like something like Guild Wars 2, where they use that as monetization for a free-to-play game. Okay. They, they don't really uh, have any gambling aspect to them. Like, with the loot boxes in Overwatch, you can earn them in-game. I've never personally spent money on them, but if you wanted to, you can. Uh, I don't have a problem with microtransactions as a whole, but loot boxes, I feel like they should be pushed away and they should try and find fairer unless, I don't know, it, it's kind of like preying on the addictive personality trait that I don't like about the loot boxes and microtransactions. Yeah. I think it's like, it comes back to all of the psychology of it, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Like, because of the fact that, you know, you've got addictive behaviors, which is just, it's, it's gambling effectively. It gets the kind of the same ideology going as, as for, you know, any other form of gambling. Um, and that leads to, to addiction. And that leads to even further issues in regards to like, say, for example, social issues. Okay. We, we all know the the classic, you know, meme of people that play video games, don't go outside and don't talk to people, but the risk is, is that because of the addictive nature of microtransactions, it could actually genuinely have an impact on that. Um, and I think that's why we we should be kind of like calling one, you know, not encouraging the practice, I guess, and two, um, not actually calling on on governments to kind of input legislation on stuff like this. Um, yeah. Eclipse, have you got anything to say on the matter regarding microtransactions? Well, yes, actually. So for me. 
uh, I guess my stance kind of goes more towards Waffle's opinion in that microtransactions and loot boxes are very much different things. Yep. Um, to me, a microtransaction isn't really in a geek paid game. It, like, because if a, let's be honest, if a paid game puts something paid to win, for example, Battlefront 2, then you instantly get that pay to win aspect doesn't really come through anymore because no one wants to pay for it so it ends up getting taken out. So microtransactions don't work in a game like that. They work in I guess in theory in FIFA, but that's within a game mode of the game and no one cares because it's like Hearthstone. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mind you, Hearthstone is free to play, so I guess it's more eligible there. However, like um games, for example, like Apex and stuff, where you open crates or loot boxes or anything you want to call them to gain cosmetic value. Um I understand the point that I can't remember if it was either Waffle or Craze was making that people see that better thing and go, ooh, they must be good. Because typically anyone that is willing to spend that money on a game is of a higher caliber in the game. Like you don't really see people outside of DMG and above in CS with a knife. In Rocket League, you don't see people with black market decals and expensive things outside of the champion ranks and stuff. And uh, I'm going to assume skins and things in Overwatch, Dota, everything like that has a similar kind of way of working. And I feel like if someone's already put enough time into the game uh, to get to those ranks, because obviously some people get there in 100 hours, but a lot of people take thousands of hours to get to these ranks. Uh, I feel like at that point, is it really the loot boxes that's making someone addicted or is it just the game itself? Um, people are just addicted to the game, uh, to the game and they just want to make themselves look better. So I personally don't have that big of an issue with it, as long as it's not really pay to win. Um, and I prefer that it mostly stays within uh, free to play structured games as well. I think um, to feed in on this a little bit again, <laughs> um, it kind of opens up a new realm of games. So take, for example, um, the mobile classic here, Asphalt 9, um, which is a really specific racing game uh, that I play sometimes. I've not played it in a couple of weeks since sort of a couple of weeks after ESL won Birmingham. But in that game, you you play the game and, and stuff's free to do, right? So you can unlock more cars, you can do more levels, all that kind of jazz. It's all free. And then you hit not a wall, but the the kind of the learning curve drastically increases. Mm-hmm. Um, and it almost as like, okay, we've you've played enough of the game to actually enjoy the game and get the hang of it. And now you better goddamn pay some money or otherwise you're not going to be able to compete with people. Um, and that's, I think, whilst it's a positive thing that it's creating the innovation almost to an extent, the issue is, is that it, you know, it means that you're only getting sort of 25% of the game um, or, or whatever, which I don't know, like if it's free in the first place and you can unlock everything anyway, is that an, an issue? Like, should something like that be regulated? I, I, I don't know. Um, um, I, I like personally, in that sense, when something is free to play, like a lot, something that I've, I find that like speaking to people about microtransactions as a whole, especially when it comes to free to play games, more than anything, is that people are always like, oh, I don't really want to have to pay for this or that or the other. Um, but at the end of the day, they're making that game free. They've spent money and time making that game. They do need a form of revenue to come yeah, back. Yeah. So, like, take Smite or Realm Royale or anything the high res does, actually. All of their models are free to play. And uh, they all have cosmetic sides of it and stuff. And, like, the first ever Smite World Championships was effectively funded by people buying cosmetics. Um, like, uh, I personally recently went uh, for Esports Wales to ESI Brighton. I don't know if anyone knows that. It's a little Esports Insider hosted event. And Todd Harris, the owner of Pyrez, was there. And that this is and this is the only reason why I know so much about it, why, from his point of view, is because I was speaking to him about it. And he was saying, like, obviously, there are people that do it wrong. And there are people that do it like EA did it, where they were just going for that money grab. They wanted you to pay £60 for the game. Then they wanted you to pay £60 to get anywhere in the game. And, like, uh, Destiny, for example, you had to pay 20 quid per expansion in Destiny. Okay, yes, you got more content. Not very much, as everyone knows, those are the memes of Destiny. But you still had to pay £40 on top of the 60 quid you paid initially to get that expansion onto the game that should have been there in the first place, all because Activision was trying to money money grab. And I feel like there's there's a very big difference between a money grab... In, especially when it comes to free-to-play games, I feel it's difficult to money grab per se. World of Tanks does it quite well, I guess, but like outside of that, 
and then in a paid game, I can understand it a lot more, especially if it's a sixty-pound AAA game, and not like say a fifteen-pound AA game like Rocket League, where it is fifteen pound at the end of the day. Spending a little bit more on cosmetics isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, the whole reason I wanted to talk about this uh, subject was I seen a, an article on BBC that was actually became quite popular. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, the title of it is "My Son Spent Three Thousand One Hundred and Sixty Pound in a One Game." And this wasn't a AAA game. This was a little mobile game called Hidden Artifacts. I don't know whether you've seen it. It's, it's advertised. Yeah. It's advertised all over the internet on games. And the reason that I feel my microtransactions have come under fire is because of this. Uh, well, obviously, it's been under fire for a long time because they can be seen as shady things. But this article really points uh, paints them in a bad light. Um, right. So it's quite. It's a bit of a touchy subject. This uh, woman, she's got a 22-year-old disabled son. He's got cerebral palsy, uh, complex epilepsy, autism, learning difficulties, and his approximate cognitive ability is of a seven-year-old child. Um, so he's unable to do a lot of things, so he heavily relies on his iPad and PlayStation for entertainment and ed some educational activities. Um, and he'd recently started playing this, iP this iPad game called Hidden Artifacts, and in uh, three months, three months, between 18th of February and uh, 30th of May this year, he spent £3,160 on the game. See, this is this is the question that I have, is why, where does the responsibility lie? Because obviously, the mother knew that he had an iPad, and that that iPad, she must have put some some form of payment details on there in order for him to use it and uh, be able to actually purchase things. So why didn't she have... Like, there's a lot of things in place to allow the stopping of purchases on any form of, uh, say, tablet, phone, uh, games console, PC. For instance, yeah, I, yeah, I had it with my uh, nephew about six months ago. I put my uh, card onto his Xbox in order to pay for his monthly uh, live. And a couple of weeks later, I, I noticed 40 quid have gone out of my bank account. And... <clears throat> That uh, that's well. I put I put a passcode on there, but um, I told his mother it, and obviously she told him it. So in the end, I ended up taking that off. Uh, took my card off that completely. So just to maybe finalise this subject, where where do you think responsibility lies when it comes to stopping these micro these huge microtransactions fees and uh, and purchase that's happening in in this where does it does it lie with the developers does it lie with parents does it lie with the people purchasing it or i mean personally i see it as being based on the computer uh, the consumer more than anything be it uh, an adult or if it's an underage person then the person who's guarding them but i mean developers are going to try and make things as tempting as possible so you've just got to be wary of that. I, I don't see, like, in the end, they're there to make money. Everyone knows that. And you've, you're there to try and stop them, or not stop them from doing that. I don't really know what point I'm getting at here, but basically, I think it's the consumer. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'd like to personal wait. responsibility. So, like, you were talking about your nephews, uh, or your nephew, Jakey. So, yep. like, I have a similar thing. Like, I, uh, I used to pay for my two little cousins' Xbox Game Pass. Yep. And they would both and they would both and like I told them, you know, don't use it for anything else. Please. <laughs> <Kind of laughs> <thing like> I'm <that. laughs> giving you what I well Game Pass gives you like 120 games. I was like, you shouldn't really need to buy anything else after that. But like uh I was like but and like they and I have never had an issue with it. Obviously I think their father made me stop doing it because he got annoyed that I was paying for it for them, but that's besides the point. But like, um, I feel like when it comes to buying microtransactions and stuff, as you said, there are many, many forms to stop you pay, like, it's to stop things from being put through it. Like, you can always put like a second, like a backup on your email that you have to agree to it on your email as well. I know Xbox offers that, I believe. Yep. I think Apple does as well. So if you're buying anything in the app store, so it'll send you an email being like, are you sure you want to buy this? And like, I, I do feel that a lot of the time it comes down not so much to uh, 
it, not so much to the children that are playing or anything like that. I feel like it very much comes down to the parent or guardian, and it depends on how naive they are. Because I feel like a lot of people see the games, they're like, oh yeah, they paid £60 for the game. Big, okay, cool. They're not going to need to buy anything else then. Mm. They're not going to have this, that, the other. They're going to be on FIFA. They're not going to know there's packs on FIFA for them to buy. And I feel like that really then comes down to, okay, in the, in the, in the, in the terms of this article, I guess it is a lot more difficult because you're put in a position of you feel bad both for the, the child and where and what they've been given in life and then the parent and what they have to deal with. Yep. Whereas in a lot of, like I've, I've read articles similar to this, where it's like my child spent 10 grand on Fortnite or whatever it was. And the child was fully able, went to school every day. The, the parent was just as able, but just failed to realize that, that these options were in the game. And is that really your, the child's fault or is that the parent's fault for not caring enough? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Are, are they really yeah. just chucking their child in front of the computer to keep them quiet, not realizing what consequences that could have on their bank accounts? I mean, there's like, there's a, there's a few different elements to it, um, in, in my opinion. So imagine nowadays, say, for example, there wasn't like Windows Defender or anything. Imagine if you let your kid go on the computer and do whatever they wanted and... Um, you needed that computer for work or whatever, and you didn't. You didn't install any antivirus. Like, imagine not protecting yourself and be like, "Yeah, just just do whatever you want, download whatever you want." Like, on one hand, there's that element of it where it's like the parents should, you know, shouldn't be lazy. I suppose should like protect themselves. Um, like any any system where you you're putting in your your financial details and you're like, "Yep, remember these details forever." how how liable are you for anything at that point um and like in in some situations it's almost like i don't know like jake with your with your specific example you you gave your details to an individual that you trust and then they didn't know the risks so it's an element of like you know the 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 parents not knowing i suppose like the the best analogy that i was i was thinking of this is that i manage imagine your um your kid was like, can I have 50 quid to go to the cinema? And you're like, yeah, cinema sounds fine. And they were going to the cinema and then they were doing like heroin or something. Like that's, that's the equivalent. <laughs> wow. Of like, <laughs> oh. but my, my point is, is that it's like a side add on to the thing that you think that you're aware of. So you're almost like not aware of it to an extent. Um, and that's, that's kind of an issue. I mean, to the other, in, in the other extreme, we have the fact that if you look at literally anything, um, any any anything that's kind of gambling based or okay, right? I'm getting I'm getting a lot of references in chat about the heroin heroin <laughs> point. We'll change it. We'll change it to any kind of very addictive fast food. Yeah, I went and spent forty quid on fast food there. Okay, yeah, they've got that's, no, they've that's got that's that's heroin. Yeah, they've gone to the cinema and they've bought 20 kilograms of popcorn or something. I think it's the yeah. better reference. Some, there. <laughs> something, <laughs> obtuse, <laughs> something obtuse is not good for kids, uh, which they shouldn't be doing. But you're not aware of it being a bad thing or that they're doing it. That's a much better Again, reference. Back to, back, back to, yeah, back to my other point. Of <laughs> if it was any other form of gambling, there would be a regulation in place. Um So this should theoretically be exactly the same. Like, say, for example drinking drinking alcohol okay you don't feel bad for the for alcohol companies because there's so many like regulations in place to be able to manage who's buying alcohol and making sure that they're using it responsibly and putting support in place for when you know people don't use it responsibly uh, and become a, come addicted to it um but whereas with you know esport or uh, not esports gambling god that's going to get us a wonderful reputation um in regards to like microtransaction gambling, if you will, um, it's almost a case of it's too new to for you know the impact to be seen. Like if you look at drinking or smoking for a very long period of time, it's happened easily 100, 200 years, so that we're sort of informed enough about it to be able to create proper proper regulations. You know what I mean? Um, but but you know, I can see that. But gambling as a whole, as a idea has been around for a long time so i feel like even though it's new it's kind of you can go back and look at previous gambling and kind of regulate it that way 
yeah, I suppose. I mean, like what I would say is that one, it's it's less known about. Two, they it's not known how much money's being made on it yet. So it's like, does the government want to get involved in regards to like taxing the the profitable income and stuff like that in a in a different method methodology, if you will, um, and that they. Like I, I understand the point that gambling's been around forever, but this form of gambling hasn't. And um, you know, like if you if you look at like um, okay, go to an arcade machine. You kind of know what the rules are with an arcade machine. Um, in regards to like say one of those those grabby claw things or whatever, whereas you you don't know what's happening in regards to you know you're going to get something. You just don't know what it's going to be, or you know you don't know what you're buying, or it, you know it's it's weird, I suppose. Can I? Okay, so. Uh, on the on the whole, uh, I feel like this time I I have to disagree with the whole. This type of gambling hasn't been around forever. No, okay. this gambling has always been around forever because it, loot boxes. If you consider loot boxes in CS as gambling, because you're gambling and you can potentially get something worth thousands of pounds. Yes. Yep. So uh -huh. that is the exact same as going to a casino and putting a hundred pounds on black in thing to win a million quid. It's the exact same. It's all percentages. This gambling is the exact same. It's just more easy access, and and that's the difficulty that people have with it. They don't they don't see it as being, they don't like because at the end of the day, it's not really gambling. If you give them the odds, it's not technically gambling anymore. You know what you're getting, and that's the difference between going to a casino and playing roulette or blackjack or poker, to playing a game and doing a loot box, and a lot of the time, a loot box. Is it's like saying you're gam you're going out um and you're spending ten pound in a shop and in that shop you give them ten pound and they give you six random pieces of clothing. Is that gambling? Because that's effectively what a loot box is. Sounds you, like a uh, bargain. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it definitely is a bargain. But do you get what I mean? Like this form of using money and and get getting something in return has been around forever. Sales do it two, three, stuff like that, they're all, those offers and things are all effectively what loot boxes are currently doing. So it, it depends on where you want to regulate it. Uh, do, you, do you stop putting age peggy restrictions that if, if it has a trading uh, or like a loot box in it, it has to be a 12 plus. So that at least they're so, somewhat competent on what that means. I'm pretty sure they have done that in Germany at least. They've given Overwatch like an up 18 rating because of the loot boxes. I'm sure I've heard something similar to that. There's been talks about it, and there's been talks about uh, a lot of uh, the European countries are actually looking at regulations on loot boxes and stuff like that. So that's certainly going to be interesting to see what comes of that. Um, yeah. Well, I currently think the Lowlands definitely have banned loot boxes. I know that for a certain. Like, because I have a friend in the Netherlands who, like, he can no longer like Valve either turned off the market to it two loot boxes or they stopped loot boxes whereas they make too much money off loot boxes so they just turned off the market and like that was their way around getting banned wholeheartedly if that makes sense yeah because then they're not gambling to increase the value because at that point you are just opening a loot box to get something for yourself which is just like going to a shop and buying like in tiger you get those boxes for a pound that has random things from the shop in it like at the end of the day that is what it is in the grand scheme of things yeah i mean like so if you take like a if you take microtransactions you're buying a thing and you know what you're getting with a yeah. loot box you're buying a thing and you don't know what you're getting um and i suppose the argument could be made that it's gambling but it's also not gambling because you know you're gonna get something but like i, I suppose if you took like roulette for example Statistically speaking, you can roughly work out what the chances are of I put a tenner on zero, how much money am I going to get back? And yeah. the answer is going to be zero the vast majority of the time. But because with loot boxes, you know you're going to get something back, does that really define it as kind of gambling or just it's more morally gambling -like, dubious? Isn't it? It's surprise yeah. Yeah. mechanics. Yeah, surprise. surprise. <laughs> you are right. In, in gambling, the whole, the whole. I, I, I believe, like one of the definitions of gambling is that is the fact that when you put something into it, there is a chance to lose it all. Yeah. Whereas in loot boxes, you don't have that chance because you will always gain something. You may have a loss in money. So say you buy a, a crate for two pound, and the thing, the skin you get is only a pound. So yeah, you've lost a pound. 
you haven't lost it all. And I feel like that's the difference between gambling and loot boxes is when I go to a casino and I have a hundred pounds, I can lose that hundred pounds. Whereas when I go to a crit, I don't necessarily lose that hundred pound. Its value is just placed into something else. It's like buying a car. Are you getting, are you gambling on a car to keep its value? Because it's not going to. You're gonna spend twenty grand on a car for it to be worth five grand later on, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think feel like so you're gambling on it. You're losing money. That's that like but that's, that's, that's that's not gambling though. That's knowing that a car's gonna degrade in value over time. Yeah, it has like, depreciation, but that's the same for any item on anything ever. Anything always has a depreciation. Like, look at a game. A game you buy it for sixty quid, but then it's like to, a year down the line, you can buy the same game with three expansions for the same price, even though you've bought it from the start and paid one hundred twenty pounds. But I don't know about that logic because it's the same with gambling just as a whole. Like you go into it knowing you're either going to win or lose. You still know what you're going to get out at the end of it. It's the same saying that you're going to get something out of a loot box. I get that. But... I agree. But... And this is the... And this... Okay. the main reason I have a problem with like loot boxes is that they're so marketed towards children, whereas mm. gambling as a whole, you 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 see all the eighteen plus sign. Like it's very easy to stop a kid from going into a casino or something like that. But it's just, they they prey on the kids. And like with the CSGO Lotto, Lotto scandal thing, like the YouTubers were promoting, like trying to get kids into doing it, offering free codes and all that mm. sort of thing. Yeah. It's just all focused on the kids because they just don't know better. And that's the main uh, issue uh, I have with it. Okay, fair enough. But it still they... has the hooks of a gam- like gambling to okay. me. I understand that. However, uh, I, I want to I wanna ask a quick general question. When yeah. was the first time each one of you played an 18 plus game? What age were you? Oh. I was just going to bring up this point. Probably I, know, like, I know I was like 12. Yeah, I know like I was... 10, yeah, 10, 12, something yeah. like so that. At that point, when it comes to games, like my mother, okay, she wasn't, she wasn't for it, but she'd still go in the shop and buy me that 18 plus game because to her, oh, it's only on a screen. It's the same as me watching a film. Like I, I used to watch the films. It, it's the same, and that's what, and that's the thing. It's a, it's not a, it's not really a bannable offence or anything. Do you know what I mean? Like you can't have, you can't go to jail for playing an eighteen plus game. So you can't. Whereas if you go into a casino and you are underage, you can be put in prison or whatever. And so th- I mean, there's, go on, go on, finish your point. I'll... So so like. When it comes to the whole, you know, you see gambling in casinos and stuff with the massive 18 or challenge 25 and all these things that we have in place to stop people from underage drinking, underage gambling, all these things. You can't, like, you have to think how difficult it is to hold someone that's behind a screen that may never be seen by the person that has bought it. So your mother's bought it for you. The person that got the great game bought, is it the parent that's at fault for giving you that game? And then it goes back to the whole thing of, is it just parents and stuff are too naive to realize what they're actually doing when they're giving microtransactions into a hand of a child? Yeah, and they're giving your bank details to them to use forever. I mean, yeah. That's another big thing. Games, Go sorry. That's uh, right. The Go games on, back finish. when we were young, they, they never had this sort of gambling system within. And people don't now, still don't know now to look for it in a game. I think as we grow older and we start having kids and stuff like that, it's good we're going to be more informed on that kind of thing. But I do think it should be right now more made more apparent to the parents who are buying the games for their kids who still don't know that these sort of things goes on in games. And yeah. Well, that's what I go back to, of like the naivety of, of parents and guardians and all of those. Like I know my brother, whenever he bought me a game, he knew exactly what was in that game. He knew what was happening. And so he wouldn't give me a stupid game. Do you know what I mean? But like when it comes to... When it comes to this kind of thing, it, it is very much more of a difference. I guess there's a lot more naivety in it, uh, and no one's looking into it as much. Yeah, I mean, like, so first off, first thing I want to point out is that some people in the chat were playing 18s at six or seven year old, and I think you need to have like a a conversation with your parents about that one because <laughs> yeah, I saw some that sort of therapist is going to need to be informed. Um, the the second point that I'd kind of make there is that. The, the closest thing that we have to compare it to is um, online gambling for a website, right? If you were to gamble online um, through, you know, Betfred or Paddy Power or, you know, Bet365 or whatever, you have to use your passport details to, um, like, 
justify your age effectively to, to verify your age. Um, and the issue is, is that there is nothing like that for kids. It, it goes back to uh, Wafflesworth's point on um, the fact that it's kind of marketed towards kids. It's a, it's, a, it's a big issue in a sense because it's like, why would you allow this thing and this thing? They're almost the same, but the rule sets are kind of different. And yeah. I think I think that needs further kind of investigation to an extent in regards to the the appropriate impact. Um, and I think it's it's kind of weird, right? So say for example. Um, you stole your parents' passport to go and gamble on a website, you, you're easily able to go to prison for that. Whereas if you were to steal your parents' credit card and go and buy like 7,000 FIFA Ultimate Teams packs, <laughs> just kids being kids, et cetera. You're, like, you're, you're, you're not liableless, but you still are. You know what I mean? It's, it's weird. But um, my final thoughts on the whole thing are that, you know, if it doesn't affect gameplay, it's okay, but it still needs to be regulated because it has a, a psychological impact on kids. Two, um, if it does affect gameplay, uh, then the alternative methodologies to ensure that you can get that stuff um, should be easy and, and not, you know, like a cliff, effectively. There you go. Um, like my, my final thing is on the age restrictions you were saying about the thing. Well, Steam is a perfect example. If I want to go and look at an 18 plus game, I don't even have to put my age in. I can just literally type in yeah. the 1st of January, 1999. And it just, it's like, yeah, all right, sound, it's a good one. Go on, go and see the game. <laughs> it's like it, it doesn't care they, they, and i feel like a lot of people think of games just as a bit like films where in reality yes yeah, okay it's an 18 plus you should be 18 to see it. it's only rated that though because people think it's a bit gory it's a bit this it's a bit that and it could be scarring to a child but at the end of the day if your parents think it's okay for you to watch it they're like oh yeah well i watched that when i was a kid and i nothing that bad happened to me like the thing is how are you gonna then enforce people to also put their child's details onto their xbox because i know for my for, for example my xbox account is still under my mother's email because i cannot change that it is just not a thing but like do you know what i mean like a child can still get their fire and be like oh i need your i need to prove my age uh, as well can you can you just prove my age for me no like, yeah right and then it's under the parent's name again and this is what i mean you i feel like when it comes to gaming it's going to be a lot more difficult whereas a parent sees a gambling website is like yeah no I ain't doing that for you, Jeremy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's it's certainly something that we could probably spend like another two hours at least talking about. But uh, uh, yeah, we, I feel like we should oh, probably 100%. probably try and move on a little bit. Um, so yeah, next up, I want to talk about some uh, uh, general game news. But first of all, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Wafflesworth, who's going to run you through some uh, over big, big, big Overwatch changes that are going to be coming very, very soon. So in the next big Overwatch update, they're really trying to shake up how competitive is played and how it, how it's structured. Basically, in, currently in Overwatch, you can select like as many tanks or DPS or healers as you want. But uh, with the new role lock system, they're going to be forcing players into two tanks, two DPS, and two support composition by making you select which role you'll be playing before you queue up for a match. So each role will have a separate skill rating or SR associated with it to allow players to, with it, to play with other people who are around their skill level on that particular. So basically, if you've only played sport or something like that and you want to give DPS a chance, you don't need to worry about throwing the game by playing DPS. Uh, and in placements, it used to be, or it, currently it's 10 placements, but it'll be five for each individual role. So it would be more or less, depending on how many roles you want to play. And to coincide with that, and the potential juggling of all the different SR on different they're going to be making it so that there's no SR decay, which is great. Uh, I don't think there's much other than balance changes. Uh, like there's some hero changes like Brokita getting changed and stuff to coincide with all this. But other than, I think that's the overarching main big thing about this. Anyone have any thoughts on it? Well, yeah, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, I think, go, on, go on, you go first and then I'll talk. Thank you. Because like I was reading, because obviously I've been, I read up on this like the other day and I saw that like, they're also in the in competitions now. They're also gonna have specific seats and stuff for your roles. Yeah. And, and and like if you change role during the match, you have to physically move seat. Like and they said you cannot say where you are. Say if you're a DPS and you're one side of the table and you want to become a tank next match. Yeah, like you have to actually move over there to be and so you, you'll see people picking up their keyboards and stuff and trotting along the stage and replugging it in. And I'm just like, surely that absolutely makes no sense. 
and it's going to stop the complete need to change roles at all because what's what's the point? What's the the point? only what's the reason I could think that they might do something like that is for some sort of production thing where they're having specific things set up on the like the cameras on specific players who are doing specific roles. Other than that, it just seems really contrarian to make them do that. So uh, here's here's a little insight into the esports world. So for each um, player, they tend to have their own SSD, uh, and then they will have their own keyboard and their own mouse specifically because they can they tend to hold their own settings. Um, so what that means is is that every time a player sets up on a computer, they set up well them or the the team sets up their SSD, their mouse, their keyboard, their mouse mount, whatever. So if they did have to physically move places between games, yes, the um, uh, the team that's managing it or whatever would have time to be able to move stuff between um, places. But again, it comes back to that point of, is there much point? Like, it, I, I have kind of issues when it comes to kind of hard locking your characters into roles in the way that Overwatch does. Um, so if you take, for example, back in the day, back when I used to play it, Symmetra would be a support character, right? Um, so what that meant was, is, you know, the, the character should be based around supporting the, the team and, and making the team strong. That character was a DPS character because she had six turrets uh, and a giant goddamn wall that you would just fire at people, right? And the thing is, is she was never, when she was played for, you know, that short period of time, she was played as a as a dps character not as a as a support character like you should play i don't know mate you should play around things and let people to be mobile in regards to uh the meta and their choices so that the game can become fresh um i think in regards to pubs i think it's a good idea in regards to the competitive scene maybe not so much um if you look at uh oh, this is gonna become a league dota thing again but a few years ago, League had a, a massive case where because one of the pro players decided to play in a, a non-standard way or play a character in the way they weren't designed to, they received penalties for that. And that's that's kind of silly, in my opinion. Like, let people mix things up and, and change the meta and, and be malleable. Um, I think for um, pubs, really good thing. Competitive scene, not so much. There you go. I think with the point that you bring up about it being stale and fresh, that's exactly why they are doing this. Because for the last year and a half, there has been one comp that just dominates all of Overwatch. And that consists of three tanks and three supports. And I think they're yeah. struggling to find any way of introducing new things to the game that won't just amplify the effect of that. They want people playing DPS. They want people playing the supports and the tanks. Plus, I know for a fact that Jeff Kaplan, the lead developer on the game, he plays a lot of Overwatch. He, he plays ranked. He's like gold or something. And he sees firsthand that... In public games, people just choose too much DPS. They, he says that he'll have to choose between playing the solo healer or solo tank. And I don't think that's like the vision they had for the game. And that's possibly why they're trying to force this so much. They w basically want people playing as many of their characters as possible. I feel like I feel like imagine I can, like my so obviously as a Rocket League game manager my my go to when it comes to any esports related things is obviously Rocket League, but I feel like in this situation that'd be like forcing a team of three to use separate cars. Mm. Like at the end of the day, it is widely regarded that the Octane is the best generalized hitbox, etc., etc., etc. And then there's a very few people that'll use Dominus and Batmobile, but you shouldn't be forced to play Octane, Dominus, and Batmobile all in one game just because. You, um, you can't make a good meta, yeah. <laughs> which is really what we're looking at because your balancing sucks so much that you have to make the rules, yeah, to, yeah. to if, so if, people play different characters effectively. Or, or, um, like Siege, for example, as well. Like Siege will have you'll have entries, you'll have supports, etc. But you're never gonna get it that someone plays this, like this character, this character, this character, and they're gonna always play different characters every single time that they play around. So say you're going to pick Thermite one round, you're going to pick Thermite the next attack round as well. You're not going to just stop picking Thermite all because it doesn't, like, you want to change it up. That's I just that's not how competitive games work. It, that's like telling a... It's like telling a football player, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, you're a goalkeeper, but actually you need to play striker next for the next half an hour because we can't have you in goals. We, we need to spice it up a little bit. Mm. You have your role, do you know what I mean? I get that, but I think it's 
there's a lot of things that they've tried in order to balance out and almost stop the goats matter but everything they've done has basically not worked and goats in my opinion they're terribly boring to watch it's normally very very one-sided it's normally just one team steamrolling the other basically whoever's got the better goat set up which isn't it's not the way the game should be played, in my opinion. I, like, I casted uh, a lot of uh, Team Tan's Overwatch uh, uh, season in the AHC not long ago, and every game it was just goats. It was just goats, 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 and it was just like, this is just boring. They're always the same goat set up, obviously slightly different for different maps. You'd have Bunker Comp or dive dive goats and so on and so forth and it's just it can get boring and i think that's another one of the reasons they've tried to um they've tried well they're implementing this system i don't know whether waffles agrees yeah i mean i see where you're coming from it does like there's no doubt it reduces the amount of freedom that you have when you're playing it and what you can choose but i also agree that they've done a bad job a bad job of balancing like the tanks and healers, that's why they've run in the three tanks, three healers setup. It's just because it's too strong. Like the DPS can't stand a chance in those scenarios. But I don't know if you've ever watched an Overwatch League stream, especially in season two. But it's kind of ironic, but the or a joke. But the chat is basically filled with just what is it, resident sleeper every time yeah. a coach comp comes up, and it's just. I think as a spectator sport or like a spectator esport, it'll be just so much more enjoyable to watch when you've got those like hit scan players. It's a lot. It'll be a lot more unpredictable. That's what yeah. I want to see. Because yeah. the thing is, like, especially to watch it, a three tank, three healer. This, it's not that there's no skill to it. Obviously, there's a huge amount of skill. You can't. It's not translated as well to the viewers. I don't think it's mainly just like strategy and things like that and it's just less clear who's really like pulling their weight and who's making the big plays whereas with dps you see someone getting a headshot and killing the entire team yeah you know they're doing well yeah i mean like my my kind of final thoughts on it are that in order to break a stale meta so say for example with doa because i know it you do that by creating balance changes to buff the weak people and nerf the good people so with like the six or seven overwatch heroes that are all quote unquote good they've all been around since pretty much the beginning of the game so like there, there needs to be in a, a kind of a, a suitable adjustment somewhere where you rebalance and you rechange things so that this isn't the the same thing that's picked every every time like it comes it comes back to this ideology of you know it's a positive thing that things will change but it's a negative thing that the balance is so off that the same thing's going to happen. Because all that's going to happen is they're going to put in these rules where there has to be two DPS, two tank, two support. And it's going to be the same six or seven people that get kicked, that picked over and over again. And I don't think it's going to change that much once the once the meta's worked out. You know what I mean? Like, because, you know, say, for example, uh, I assume Widow is going to be DPS nowadays. Say, for example, they play, you know, like Zen, Lucio, and a, a couple of squishy people when they don't play any tanks, well then Widow's gonna become meta. And if they if they play a lot of shields, then you know someone like um Junkrat's gonna become meta and it will stale out again because of poor balancing, not because of the rule set that's been that's been put in place. But yeah, there's me there's my rant. There you go. Enjoy it. <laughs> well you say it'll be stale. I don't know, like we can't say that for sure right now because we don't know how it's gonna pan out. It's already pretty stale. Like, I think they had to do something drastic. Plus, it's people just wanted games where you just go into a match and you know that you're going to be playing healer and you know that you're going to have two tanks to support you rather than just having four DPS and then one tank and one healer. I think yeah. people are just a bit fed up of the fact that there's so many people who just want to play DPS and nothing else. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I, I totally get that. I get that trying to change it is a positive thing. But the fundamental issue is that they're not addressing the root cause of the issue that's caused them to be in the place that they're in, which means that it's going to be kind of trying to fix a fix a you know we'll we'll fix this hole in the boat by just tipping loads of water out. 
you know what I mean? It's, it's not going to work until you patch the hole. And the hole is the, they need to take a new kind of approach to power balancing to be able to kind of make things work. I think it's going to be a, a positive thing for pubs because people are trash in pubs. I think, you know, hopefully it'll be a positive thing for the competitive scene, but it's, it's not a long-term resolution. It's a short-term fix for a long-term issue. No, I agree with that. Well, partly, but they, they have tried patching this. They've changed how the armor system works in the game like just to try and stop the tanks being so prevalent the character that they introduced that kind of started this all off Rookie. Rookie, the, yep. she has received i think about 11 quite major nerfs and she's still played in it uh, they've nerfed lucio as well just because of this comp still played it they've tried so many different nerfs and i don't think they just want to nerf one of the characters into the ground so that they can't be played because there's still other tanks and other healers that have replaced those when they become less meta it's just the fact that tanks and supports can put out so much more when played together than uh, a dps can i am all like when it comes to nerfing characters and stuff in games like uh siege did it really well like you see it every season there's a new like every season of of siege there is always a new meta that is always a new meta it always constantly evolves and that's because not only do they nerf someone but you you have to buff someone enough for them to be worth it after a nerf anyway like um ella for example in siege like she got nerfed once but still worth using because there was no one to replace her as a as a roma that good and then they brought in people like vigil and they then took over ella's throne and then they'd be nerfed, and someone else comes in, and this, and, and this is what I mean. And like, you you nerf and you buff, and you nerf and you buff, and eventually you'll always get a new meta. But if you don't, if you don't improve someone, and you don't give people that chance to actually try them, what's the point of changing if you're only going to nerf someone and the other guy is still terrible? Well, they ha they do do that in the patches. Like I remember one time they. I think if they nerfed Brig at one point and then like buffed Doomfist and Doomfist just became oppressive. So they kind of just had to nerf him back because if you nerf someone who counters someone else and then buff that counter, obviously you're going to get a lot of people playing that. But the, the, the way they kind of try to balance the 2-2-2 two, two, two as well, they're moving away from like hybrid characters like Predita. She's much less of a tank now than she was. She used to be like a healer tank almost. And uh, they've changed it so that she's much more of a support. She'll heal more but tank a lot less so i think the fact that they they're locking it to a 222 means they can actually balance a lot easier in theory like whether they do or not obviously it remains to be seen potentials there well it like, become my, a much more balanced game my 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 final thoughts on the whole balancing issue is that honestly if you buff a, that's all like yeah you you made a bad point there if you have a counter if you have two characters that counter each other and you nerf one but you buff the other then you're always going to have issues and i feel like that's not so much because they have nerfed or buffed either one that's because they just don't know how to balance a game because at the end of the day you do not buff someone to a point when they count to the other team after you've just buffed that after you've just nerfed the, the the person they counters that that doesn't logically make sense you've nerfed one of them so they should now be more equal mm. so then it would make it more reason to play and what i meant by the whole buffing as well as nerfing is that you got to nerf someone one side and then buff someone the other side. So say you've nerfed a certain tank, but you've buffed the DPS. P that person that used to play that tank all the time might go, oh shit, I'm going to go and try that DPS now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, not, I agree with like, that. When it comes to um, sort of buffs and nerfs, it's not about getting absolutely perfect balancing. It's about changing it up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this for literally half an hour at this point. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, again, it's another subject we could probably spend all night talking about. I I shouldn't have picked all of these for one uh, one one yeah, talk show, should I? Yeah. Um, either way, yeah, Overwatch is going to see some big changes, uh, including the Overwatch League. Uh, that's gonna we're gonna see how that pans out in the future, no doubt. Um, yeah. going to be very interesting to say the least. And uh, I want to move on to talk about um a game that I used to play a lot and I've been starting to get back into. It's uh PUBG. Um. And to before moving on to the actual sub subject, I do have a quick video to show you all. So, put that on screen for you now. When I was a boy, 
I watched my world explode. I thought I lost everything in that fiery nightmare. But what I found in the rubble of my childhood awakened me. I was the first lone survivor of Erangel. But I would not be the last. The island showed the scared boy that he could be a survivor. That's what I want for you. To meet your true self. Will you embrace who you're meant to be? Or is this all you are? Will you find a person strong enough to conquer their fear? Or will you die because you were too weak to understand it? Yes, my friend. Everyone is searching for themselves. That search ends here. The place I once called home. Welcome to my battlegrounds. Right, so yeah, that was the PUBG backstory that's come out like a couple of days ago. It's very interesting. Uh, what you've seen in the video, there was a kid who was living in a house. Uh, it got absolutely demolished as, uh, as where he was living got demolished by war and uh, he grew up to almost, like, almost inherit the, the area he was living in, and from what I can see, it's almost as if he's, it, it's going down the way that the Culling, uh, if anybody remembers the Culling, one of the original Battle Royale games, uh, it was based as if it was a TV show, and that looks like the backstory that uh, PUBG are going for there. Certainly very interesting. Um but along with that, uh, the next big major update coming for PUBG is the developers are actually looking at reworking the maps. So Erangel is the first one that they're working on, which has been in the game since the start. They're only, I think they're mainly visual changes, so updating textures, making them look better, and so on and so forth. Uh, along with those map reworks, they are going to be doing some gun balancing, which actually will be in uh, in the light, it will be in... The patch will be live by the time that we're actually competing in the Chicken for Charity PUBG event, so that may make the game interesting if we haven't learned what guns have changed in which ways and so on and so forth. So I'm looking forward to those um, those changes coming for PUBG very soon. And I um, don't know if anybody has anything to say on that. I don't think so. There's not much really to say. Yeah, it's quite a, it's so quite we... a, it's a positive thing that stuff's changing. There we go. Yeah, as I was going to say, to be fair, one thing I've noticed with PUBG is that they kind of fell behind Fortnite in the sense of they don't change anything, really. You have an occasional extra gun year, you have an occasional map year, but nothing else really changes yep. all too much. <laughs> yeah, so uh, moving on, we're going to be talking about some news from within eSports Wales. And uh, last week on uh, this show, we actually announced our two new Overwatch teams. And starting this week, they this week they will actually be performing in the All Heroes Cup. And uh, Esports Wales, you may know, have taken part in the first two seasons of the AHC. And this season, we're entering both Team Town and Team Yar into the All Heroes Cup. And uh, you should be able to see on screen now the schedule for Team Tan. So uh, almost every week, I think actually every week, Team Tan have a game because. There are four teams in the group that they are in for the group stages. Um, yeah, um, it's going to be a bit awkward because we do have both teams entering the AHC, but I am looking at getting as many of those games streamed for everyone to watch and hopefully getting some casting going at the same time. Uh, alongside that, we do have the Team Yar games, which should be coming up right now. Uh, a few less games because there's only three teams in that group, so... Uh, 
they have a buy after the first week and then a buy after the fourth week. So there's only four games for them to actually compete in. And uh, Wafflesworth is actually in Team Yar, so I'm sure you're looking forward to uh, competing in those games. Oh, for sure. I mean, I played in the first uh, season we entered the old years, and it was great fun. Plus, we've got a really good team getting on with everyone in there. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we actually uh, won that first season, if I remember correctly, didn't we? Against all odds. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and also if you are interested in playing for Esports Wales, the link should be in the chat to apply to play for us. Um, yeah, so moving swiftly on, don't forget we do have our lovely merch which is on sale. Um, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Oh, god, go on, one ready. Oh, no, the music. Da, da, da. <laughs> you have to be completely serious. Go on, keep going. <laughs> we have personalized hoodies, black and white men's t-shirts, female red tank tops, mouse mats, zip-up hoodies, black and white female t-shirts, tracksuit bottoms, esports whales, flags, personalized jerseys, baseball tees, varsity jackets, polo shirts, and a snapback hat. That's everything. <laughs> I forgot that you did that the first week. Oh, why did I bring you back? Because I'm comedy, that's why, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, along with the uh, merch, we are doing our giveaway, which you can enter. That is an old picture. There probably is more than 990 entries right now. Um, so we are doing that as well. The link should be in chat right now. <laughs> is this a JML commercial? It may as yes. well be with Craze on board. It may as well be. Uh, yeah, the giveaway is in chat now. If you do want to enter it, you could be in with a chance of winning yourself one of those lovely esports Wales jerseys. Um, uh, one thing that I, uh, I mentioned briefly about before is we are participating in a charity event for Special Effect. And just to give you an idea of what Special Effect is all about, I'm going to show you a quick video which should be coming on your screen right now. So yeah, Esports Wales are taking part in uh, a special effect charity event. Uh, it's a player unknown's battleground tournament uh, named Chicken for Charity. This is the second time that they are running it. Uh, different teams from within the gaming industry will battle out to see who wants that chicken dinner the most. We do have currently a uh, Just Giving page set up and the link should be in chat. If you do feel like donating, the more the merrier, the more money that goes towards that lovely cause helping uh, physically unable children to and other individuals to actually play games and enjoy the things that we all enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis without any sort of issue um yeah and we do actually have our confirmed team for the <laughs> for the uh, event um 
We're being named Dad's Army, uh, as you can tell. We we all ran our faces through the Face app old feature. Oh, really? Yep, it's on screen right now. We have. Yeah, uh, I can tell. <laughs> we have Welsh Boone, uh, who is the King of Panic. We have uh, Bega, who is uh, the Sniper Senpai. We have NX, who is the extra backpack space. And then we also have me, who is the team captain. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the event and those pictures. I can't. I f- completely forgot what they looked like, and I'm just giggling at them now. It's scary how how real it looks, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, they are absolutely amazing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, At least you know you look like Santa when you're yeah, I was, say, I was about to say, like yeah, I look like Santa. <laughs> I've, I've had that said like three times to me now after that picture. Um, so yeah, this uh, this weekend, you may have seen on our social media that some of us actually attended, some of Esports Wales actually attended uh, Skynet LAN in Brecon. Uh, Slayer John, Ron Seal, uh, Quark, uh, Bron, uh, to name a few, also Leon, Leon uh, who I think attended. I could be wrong, but I think he did. Um, but yeah, Slayer John and along with Ron Seal actually took part in the Rocket League tournament with the help of a third that they picked up uh, when they arrived at uh, at Skynet. I thought their third was Ragnarok. He didn't end up going. Uh, I don't think oh. he purchased a ticket in time. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, his name was. He is. He, I have got his uh, Twitter handle somewhere. Um, but yeah, they actually, they actually ended up winning the <laughs> Rocket League tournament, which I, I wasn't expecting. But I know, uh, I know, Ron Seal's a very good player, and I, I do remember John tweeting out that he got very hardly car- very hard carried in those games. So, uh, well done to them. You can see them there on screen now with their Steam vouchers in hand for winning that tournament. And yeah, it's a nice little bit of positive news coming out of esports Wales. Yeah, good job. Yeah, Ooh. and uh, <laughs> scored. Wait, you scored two in the finals, John or Bronseal? Please tell me. Oh wow, interesting. Okay, I'd love to see that. Um, uh, as mentioned last week, there will be some new job roles appearing in the Discord channels. Keep an eye on the job roles. And uh, another thing that was also mentioned last week that we do want to keep on pushing: we are having an esports Wales meetup on the second of August. That is taking place in the Arcade Vaults uh, Friday Fight Night, happening at 5pm to uh, 9pm. The link will be in <laughs> chat now. Uh, if you do want to check out, check it out, and we're going to be hopefully getting quite a few people down there to, you know, have a nice night and chill out and talk and get to know each other a bit more. Um, the last meetup we had was rather, um, it was rather fun. It was, I think I'm, I'm the only one here that attended. Yeah, um, but it was it was a great night. Fun was had by all. We went to uh, Belong Cardiff and then went to the pub afterwards. You gotta go to the pub. Um, so yeah, it was all, all in all a great event, and looking forward to the next one. I'm hopefully going to make it to that one. Not too sure yet if I've got something on. Um, but yeah, I think that ends it for esports Wales. <laughs> that, I think that ends it for esports Wales news. Unless anyone else has anything coming out of. Anywhere? Not, That's not, not really. <laughs> yeah. not, not really. I know one of our, I think, team dude for Rocket League played in a uh, esports management tournament recently, but they didn't do amazingly. I think they got to like the second round or something. Oh yeah, I do uh, remember seeing that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how well they did. Didn't the daughter team or something? I'm not sure if they're how long ago this was, but didn't the daughter team do something recently as well? Yeah, they completed in a tournament and got. Knocked out by the team that went on to win, so they you did think quite well. The things that'd be the one thing I would know about, but I completely forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, how am I? The, how's the Rocket League manager the one that knows that? Yeah, That's, I know. uh, okay, I can be the Dota manager too now, John. You witnessed it first hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't manage Dota, I, I oh, do okay. all the other stuff. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right, uh, moving on to some general esports news. Uh, this weekend actually. Not happening just yet. We'll be starting very soon. IEM Chicago is actually taking place. Uh, another big CS:GO tournament. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 amazing to see so many good tournaments happening at the same time. And only a couple of weeks ago, we seen IEM Cologne. I think it was actually last week. 
yeah, last week we saw Cologne take place. Um, yesterday we seen uh, the world's former number ones in the form of MIBR take on Finnish new boys in the form of Ensa. It was a hard-fought series between the two teams with Ensa ended up taking the win 2-1. And MIBR, who have been really not looking like they used to, they, they're looking extremely revitalised in the way they're playing. Um, big news that Colzera uh, announced that he wanted to leave the team, and I think that's actually happened now, and Zeus, their coach, has stepped in, and they're actually playing along... They've actually brought in Lucas from Luminosity Gaming, another Brazilian, so looking very re- revitalised in that new lineup, and I'm ex- excited to see, hopefully, some fire come back from in their playing style. Uh, in the second semi-final of yesterday, we saw a rep- repeat of uh, ESL1 Cologne's final, with the North American powerhouse of Team Liquid taking on the French team of Vitality, uh, being led by the British player Alex. I have to get that in there. It's a big thing for the Brits, considering B- British CSGO is basically non-existent these days. Um, yeah. Sadly, uh, well, not sadly, because it's, it's, not, it's predictable now, Team Liquid showed exactly why they are the number one team in the world right now, taking down Vitality 2-0 in that semi-final. And then continuing on to the final, um, I feel Ensa really have to pull something big out of the bag if they even want to stand a chance against this liquid side as they are pretty much looking unstoppable. And yeah, that final should be, I think it's starting within the next hour, if not already, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, I've, I, I want to throw it over to Eclipse now, who's going to talk about the DreamHack Montreal qualifiers. Yes, so we currently, oh, I say currently, I, I believe they finished probably all of about half an hour ago. So um, I know Vitality and PSG qualified automatically for uh, Montreal. However, uh, sadly, our only Welsh professional player uh, dropped out fairly early in the qualifiers, uh, which means he probably will not be seen as they do not have an organization to go to Montreal. However, um, there was quite a few upsets, actually, um, believe it or not. And um, I don't. I say believe it or not, as if you guys know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, yeah. It's it's there were quite a few close games that no one expected. And uh, if any of you are fans of watching Rocket League, uh, it is quite an entertaining esports to watch, considering it is very much just football with cars. Um, yeah, Barcelona was the third person to uh, make it through the European side. I haven't looked at the NA side because I'm not NA, and it's not really what I follow mainly, but there were uh, some big ones. Um, the world championships of the world champions have passed through and the previous DreamHack champions have gone through. So other than that, there's not much big deals to talk about. Uh, and sadly, again, Triple Trouble fell out early with, uh, with our only Welsh professional. Yeah, so uh, Craze, I think you wanted to talk about the international qualifiers that have just finished. Oh, yeah. Uh, a little bit. So um obviously ti the closed qualifiers have now finished so we know all the teams that will be going to uh the international um the sort of biggest mention here is we actually have a couple of british players that have played in the closed qualifiers for the first time on on achen achen esports um which is which is absolutely immense it's kind of no real uh no real surprises well i mean there's a couple of surprises like navi actually had a good enough team to be able to qualify um in the in the cis region um, Chaos Esports Club, um, who who qualified with the uh, recently kicked from Liquid Matumba Man. So just like in the CS:GO scene, um, Team Liquid, they were TI winners last year. Uh, they had a relatively good season, not a great season, um, but it got to pretty much the end, and they kicked their mid, uh, and basically the mids got four more players and just carried through all the way through to uh, uh, TI, basically. So it's pretty uh, pretty mad to see. Uh, but I'm looking forward to to see how it spices up. Yeah, I think that's all we have to talk about this week. We didn't actually receive any questions from chat, but it's all good. Not every week we will. So uh, unless anyone has any final uh, closing thoughts. Oh, Dave. So uh, <laughs> I just Dave. Said Dave. Dave. Just yeah, Dave. 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 <laughs> okay, so Dave is a, a Welsh... Uh, a Welsh card professional. I guess he's professional. He's semi-professional, cl- close enough. Um, who currently comp- who pre- p- competed today in a um, card open uh, the CWL finals at Miami Open tournament. He qualified in it 
for it like a fortnight ago, but he ended up coming second today in a very, very close series that went into a bracket reset. Uh, he was the team that pushed it into a bracket reset. He came from the losers' finals, uh, and they took it to game five in the bracket reset as well. So, and I think it was uh, six four in the last match of S and D. So, if anyone that watches COD here, uh, I'm assuming you'll understand what I'm saying there. Um, I not going to go through an explanation of COD esports for just this little side bit, but uh, you know, so that is good. Some more up and coming Welsh esports talent from the. Hopefully, Woo! we can do some more. Yeah, the more Welsh people can do better. Anyone else with any closing thoughts? Nope. I, I like being here. Let me sing more, please. Thanks. <laughs> Waffles, yeah. anything from you? Uh, just, thanks for having me on. Okay, yeah, well. I think this concludes week three of Esports Wales Weekly. I will be uh, hopefully finding a nice little Welsh streamer to raid, so do stick by, do wait around. It shouldn't be too long. I think I've already got somebody in mind. So, yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Craze. Thank you, Waffles. And thank you, Eclipse. And thank you to all our lovely viewers, and I hope to see you all next week. Goodbye now. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.